So um, I'll get right into it. So, but uh, first, a little background about the Minnesota Aquatic Research Center. From here on out, I'm just going to say MACERC. Um, we are, uh, we've been around since about 2012. Um, we are based at the University of Minnesota. Um, we get our funding as a direct appropriation from the state legislature. I have to remind you always, we're not the DNR. We work very closely with the DNR, trying to help answer some of the research questions they have, uh, supporting management, decision-making and questions. And they, they help us a lot with our research in the field, but we don't actually have any management authority. So some, some groups it, that they don't always understand that. So I like to lead with that. But we're based in St. Paul um, and at the University of Minnesota is a really great place to house the research center because we can pull together some of the best and the brightest minds um, and the laboratory and field and computing capacity to answer some of the complex AIS questions because it's really, it's not just a biology problem. Um, AIS, it's a, it's a human behavior thing. Um, it can be about engineering and design of psychology, how we make choices. Um, and so we can put together these interdisciplinary teams to try to tackle those problems. And MACERC brings, brings it together with relatively steady funding. And we can assure that we're not doing redundant research um, and leverage the connections and capacity we have at the university. Um, and we, this is, this is gonna be talked mostly about zebra mussels, but just wanna make it known that we have a lot of different projects right now that cover invasive plants, um, invasive fish, pathogens, uh, human dimensions like economics and social science. Um, and then we do a lot of work on prevention as well. So we'll work with anybody willing to take on AIS issues. And we also work all over the state, lower based in the Metro, and we do a lot of projects in the Metro. We really do cover all, all areas of the state. And I like to show that. And this also covers our, you know, five, five to six main buckets that our research falls into. So let's um let's get into it with zebra mussels. So um they're these tiny filter feeding bivalve mussels. They have no few to no predators in Minnesota lakes, and they filter massive amounts of plankton and other particles in the water that um, has these cascading impacts in food webs. They reach sexual maturity very early, and they have explosive reproductive rates in favorable conditions. As we know, they spread easily, um, either in connected water bodies or through the boater pathway. Um, and we're at over 550. Tina, do you know how many, what the number actually is right off the top of my head? <laughs> I used to update this for every talk, but I, I'm not doing it as frequently anymore. But um, we don't have really great control methods for established or even new populations, but that is an area of a lot of active research. So. Um, I wanted to share, I like to share this picture because it really shows their siphons. Um, they have an inhalant and an exhalant siphon, and they are pumping water all the time. Um, it slows down in the winter, but in the spring and summer, they're actively feeding. And that is really kind of what is at the crux of their impact. They have other impacts. They can grow on our native mussels and have a smothering growth and directly kill um, native mussels. But in terms of the large scale ecosystem engineering, it's that filter feeding that has the impact because um, you get huge populations of zebra mussels constantly filtering all the time. Um, and it turns over, you know, an entire water body in as little as, as two days. One of the sort of foundational studies on zebra mussels at a dense population of zebra mussels at a bay in Lake Michigan, they found that that population filtered the entire contents of the bay 1.3 times a day. So that's a, that's a dramatic impact. Um, and this breaks down just some of the basic anatomy. They produce a natural, very powerful adhesive. Um, and then they have these bristle threads, have adhesive on them. They have a muscular foot that does allow them to move. They don't move a lot, but they can if they want to. Um, 
And then you have all the, the water being inhaled and the inhalant siphons. So that can contain um, plankton, phytoplankton, so plant, tiny um, plants, very small zooplankton, and all kinds of other particles go in. And what's exhaled is clearer water. Um, and other, and so they also can excrete the waste material, which concentrates nutrients at the lake bed. Um, and so they're shunting all the nutrients, phosphorus and plant material from the water column down to the lake bed. And this is where we start to get to concerns with water quality challenges. So um, in a lot of lakes that if you already struggle with water quality, uh, zebra mussels might make those challenges even harder. Um, there's a lot of kind of debate about this and misunderstandings because usually zebra mussels will, an infestation of zebra mussels could result in sort of the short-term increase in water clarity. That it's confusing because water clarity is a metric of water quality, but it's not necessarily a good thing all the time. Not every lake is meant to be clear. There are a lot of our plants and fish that are adapted to murky water. That's a natural condition for a lot of Minnesota lakes. So clear water um, can lead to a lot of impacts, and I'll get to that in a minute, but the, the water quality specifics here are this shunting of nutrients down to the lake bed at the near shore area where zebra mussels are. And sometimes you can see increases in filamentous algae because now you have nutrients at the lake bed and attachment for the algae. Um, and then another thing that zebra mussels do is they, they will consume the good algae, like the normal phytoplankton that zooplankton and tiny fish need to survive, but they will reject the toxic blue-green algae. So um, I'm guessing if you've heard of cyanobacteria or microcystis, zebra mussels are inhaling that as with everything else, but they will spit the bad stuff back out. Go ahead. Just when you talk about the filtration you know, mm -hmm. capacity and that that's a significant factor, at least you know, two lakes, Big Lake, Big Mitchell and Lake Arnold, um, I, I'm wondering how the watershed ratio to the lake plays into that because Lake Orno is, is about 1300 to one versus yeah. a normal lake is about three to one. What's big lake? About three to one. Oh yeah, in that neighborhood. Yeah. Two. So how? Yeah. No, that's a really good question. I mean, I was reading a little bit more about Lake Orno before coming down here and that, that huge amount of watershed that's draining into the lake. To me, it's it's really hard to say how zebra mussels are gonna mess with that, but it's like I look at it as you already have a lot of challenges to managing water quality in Lake Orono a lot, and now we're adding zebra mussels. It's it's really hard to say what direction that's gonna go. And then there's a lot of questions about what what will the zebra mussel population do? They might not necessarily get to a really high level. It depends on a lot of things. Um, I will come back to that okay. a little bit. I hope, I would love for this to work. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this, um, keep your eyes on like this area here. That's the inhalant um, siphon. And this is a video of a single zebra mussel inhaling um, a microcystis. See that sort of like <laughs> play again, play again. Well. <laughs> so just to it, spits it back out. Um, and so you if you just think about millions of zebra mussels doing that all day, every day during the warm season. Go ahead. If uh, just a backup question, you say they don't move much once they attach to something, they stay there. Generally, how is, they, it, they, they, how is it they move into an area then? If they, they gotta be moving from somewhere or is it just from the watershed? Uh, well, they, they, so if you have an infested water body upstream of a lake, 
and there's a water connection. The way that they would move into the downstream area is in the fellagers, which is the um, like the microscopic, like the baby zebra mussel. They're basically invisible, um, and they that they can get they can also get moved in both in the watercraft pathway really easily. Okay. And so the last thing I'm going to say about microcystis and cyanobacteria, um, those are not actually invasive species. They naturally occur in lakes, um, but with kind of climate factors and warming lakes, we are seeing more problems with harmful algal blooms. And I can't say that zebra mussels cause that, but because zebra mussels are selectively consuming other plankton and they're rejecting the bad, um, the bad plankton and, and, and microcystis, you're increasing that sort of overall proportion of the, the bad algae in a lake. And so um, it seems like it stands a reason at least that you could um, increase the chances of frequency and severity of a harmful algal bloom. So um, next thing, the next big potential impact is with um, mussels and plants. So I talked about how um, zebra mussels are making the water more clear. So when you're letting more light in, the water also becomes warmer and, you know, clearer water, more light, more warmth is just an ingredient to drive denser more plant growth further out into the lake. And so um, I've talked to a lot of lake shore folks, especially the last couple of summers with these droughts. So the plant, they're seeing plant growth much further out into the lake than they had in the past. And this is just made even more severe when you have zebra mussels because of the queer, warmer water caused by all their filter feeding activity. And there's also gonna be more nutrients down at the bottom where rooted plants like curly leaf pondweed, Eurasian water milfoil, and native species are gonna be growing. So something that I hear about from a lot of lakes that are dealing with infestations that are a couple of years in, they, I hear a lot of stories of more invasive plant challenges. So um, let's talk about some things that we can actually do. So the whole, the nutrient loading issue, water quality challenges, harmful algal blooms, it's, it's a huge issue. It's related to like global patterns, but there's a lot that can be done at the lake level, at the homeowner level. Um, anything that mitigates runoff, like um, a rain garden, natural, natural shorelines with deep-rooted perennial plants and reducing fertilizer use in lawns really helps a lot. Um, the water sc watershed scale efforts like land trusts, trying to reduce the amount of hard surfaces, sustainable farming, that helps a lot. And then really trying to keep the AIS plant species in check is, is important. And I'd say most importantly is no more other AIS introductions. A lot of people kind of think once, oh, zebra mussels are here, we're done, we're gonna throw in the towel, why bother investing anymore? But I think it's really sort of the opposite. Like if you do have zebra mussels, that's when you double down on prevention efforts because those multiple introduced species interacting is when things can get from, you know, an occasional nuisance to something really ugly. So like Lake Orono, from what I've heard, like there's the Eurasian water milfoil, challenges with water stargrass. Um, it's be good to really stay on top of management and prevention of more um, non-native plant species. Um, and then a lot of people ask, to try to understand like, wh what's the trajectory of a population? And that is um, surprisingly difficult to, to track. We don't have a lot of research on like the exact population dynamics, but I just wanted to share these two pictures because it can really vary between years. Um, this, so Pickerel Lake zebra mussels were first detected in 2019. It's generally thought that, uh, you know, the first detection is a couple years, maybe two to three years after when they're first introduced. We don't, we don't, there's no way to really know that, but um, this is two years after first detection. And so you have periods of explosive growth because zebra mussels are consuming a lot of the resources, they're colonizing all of the available space 
and then they can sometimes taper off. Um, some of the factors are cannibalism because zebra mussels send out the villagers are spawning. And so the baby zebra mussels are plankton, they're planktonic that could then just be sucked up by the adult zebra mussels and eaten. So that's a nice thing. Um, there can be resource limitations. There's a lot of factors that go on that we don't really understand yet. But it's really interesting that a pickerel, and this is just the estimate from the Lake Association president, he looks at a lot of the docks and he felt like it was about 80% less in this summer than what they had seen in 2021. 2021, they thought was sort of their peak, just covering rocks and the docks everywhere and they seem to have tapered off. That doesn't mean it won't be super bad again, but I just share this to sort of underscore how, how dynamic that can be. Go ahead. Just when you're yeah. ready for, uh, I did want to modify, um, make a modification about the challenge uh, that Lake Orono currently has, because uh, it relates to your earlier comments too. We do have a significant challenge with currently pond weed that we have been addressing. Yeah. Um, Eurasian water milfoil, fortunately, that appeared in 2020, but with the assistance of both SWCD and the DNR, uh, we were able to get a permit uh, approved to do a rapid response uh, within three weeks of it being found, and it has not been detected since. That's fantastic. Um, that's really great. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's an example of get rid of a new one. If um, oh, yeah. And then as far as you know, zebra mussels themselves, thus far, it appears they're not growing significantly in, in any way in our lake. However, that's not the case with Big Lake. That's just up yes, from yep. us. Um, yeah, I've been on Big Lake, yeah. And then lastly, the, the uh, water star grass you commented on, that that is accurate. And yep. Though that's a native, that's become a substantial new concern. Right. So I just, because uh, for both folks here and those that are online, you know, particularly the curly leaf pondweed and water star grass is what we're going to be looking to aggressively uh, address more this next season. And the verdict is yet out. Uh, that's yeah. part of why, thankfully, you're here yeah. to help give some guidance. We're not sure what we need to do or should do as far as zebra mussels. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm glad there's Dan and a couple of DNR people in the room, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, with these explosive populations of zebra mussels, yeah. since they have shells, and I'm assuming that's calcium based. Yes. Is there a calcium limitation on water bodies? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. That's um, some of the, the, the main limiting factors are um, salt calcium in the water. Having a low calcium level doesn't mean you're like safe from zebra mussels. It, it just means they are less likely to reach a super dense population because they need that calcium. There's also like an ideal range, a pH range for zebra mussels. Um, and they also need like substrate. Um, a, a, a gravelly, rocky lake bottom has a lot more habitat, optimal habitat for zebra mussels than something um, mucky or silty. However, they, they can and will readily attach on vegetation. So, and then once you get a couple established, say there's like a pebble in an area that's otherwise mucky, a zebra mussel gets on it and then they can attach onto each other. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So when, when you get, you pull your dock out and your lip looks like that? Yeah. What do we tell the people in the association to do? I mean, once it's out and it's dry, they're dead. So you can just scrape them off. Yeah. Do they scrape off easy? They do, especially when they're dried up and dead. So if you're just pulling it out for the winter and it's just going to stay right on your yard and it's going right back in the same body water, you don't have to do anything. If you were to transfer that dock um, anywhere, like take it on the road or like sell it to somebody else, you've got the 21 day dry rule and has to be basically totally clean of everything else. Uh, the, you know, we know that like most zebra mussel populations have been started from transient boaters, but docks and lifts have definitely been the source of 
multiple infestations. So, so is that a form of remediation then? You just give them something hard to attach to? Uh, if you do that, it's mostly you're just sort of putting out habitat in a place that might not otherwise exist. But there are companies that sell quote unquote zebra mussel traps. That that is basically it's either a a monitoring device, like you could just see how many come and it might be interesting, but you're not like drawing them away from where they would otherwise, you're just creating habitat. Um, impacts on fishing is a, is a big question for a lot of people in Minnesota and we've um, been researching this for a little while. Um, there was a large lake study looking at the Minnesota's nine iconic walleye, large iconic walleye lakes. And we did similar methods at um, smaller and medium lakes. And this was um, a combination of doing a, a food web study uh, at lakes that were infested and uninfested. And then they also kind of paired this with this 35 year data set that the DNR has of shoreline staining. So they were looking at walleye and perch growth over time um, in lakes sort of before and after zebra mussel invasion, and also comparing them um, um, in lakes that are still uninvaded. Um, and before I get into the, the results, like, you know, you can sort of assume that it's going to affect, affect fish because zebra mussels are altering fish habitat and they're taking away a lot of the food sources that zooplankton need, which is the main food source for baby perch and walleye. And then you have more light that changes the physical habitat conditions and those predator prey dynamics. And also walleye in particular, um, they like cold, dark water. And so there's less of that in zebra mussel infested lake. Um, and their findings were pretty remarkable. Um, in, and this was for the large lakes. Um, they found that in, um, in invaded lakes, um, walleye were 14% smaller at the end of their first year. Um, and they also were looking at spiny water fleas, which is sort of another, another topic. Um, but in lakes with both of the, both of those invasive species, they were 25% smaller. And um, the reason why that size uh, going into the first winter is really important because one, um, if they're that much smaller, they're just less robust to survive a tough winter. Um, and then if you're that much smaller, you, you know, just think about like if your mouth was 25% smaller, you'd be able to fit less stuff in it. So it, it, it just reduces their range of options for prey on top of um, a food web that's already depleted from the invasive species. So it's sort of this um, double whammy. And they're just less likely to survive to reproductive age. So this kind of has this long-term impact for the viability of the population. Swimming, um, this is something that we all know well about. So it's pretty obvious that the shells are sharp when you cut your feet. Um, if there are areas with you know, nuisance level populations and you're on the leeward side of the shore, you can see all these shells pile up. Um, and if they're stuck on plants, it can be really stinky. Uh, they can even es establish on sandy bottoms once they get any little hard substrate. You do have a lot of options for you know, making sure that your swimming experience at your at your shoreline property can still be enjoyable. Um, you know, wearing water shoes is sort of the first thing. You can scrape them off by hand um, from a, a swimming ladder or your dock. A putty knife is works really well. And you just scrape them and they'll just go down to the water and disintegrate. Um, there's not really any benefit to removing them from the water at that point. There are also a lot of lake service providers that do zebra mussel cleanup, depending on how bad the infestation is, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. Um, and then there, there are certain, there are actually like special zebra mussel rakes to clean a swimming beach. Um, and then another option, I would say with moderation, but if you've just got like a one rock or two that is having zebra mussels, you could just move it outside the swimming area. I would say do that with moderation because if if every homeowner moves all the rocks from the swimming area, like that's that has a big impact because that near shore area is, is important habitat. Um, boats, stocks, and lifts um, are, are kind of at risk of damage if you leave them in the water too long. Those <laughs> microscopic villagers can get sucked up in the intake 
And then if the boat sits for a while, say you go out of town for a month, they could just be growing and you could have a zebra mussel in a, you know, a sensitive area of, of your engine and blocking the flow, you know, resulting in lower performance, overheating, blah, blah, blah. So you really don't want zebra mussels to, you don't want that water staying in your engine, even if you're not taking it off the lake. So it's a good idea to pull the boats out of the water um, pretty much all the time. Um, and then also tilting, tilting the engine out of the water. Uh, let's see. And then of course, it's very important if you are gonna be taking your boat to another lake, doing a hot water decon is, is a really, really good idea because if you have um, you have, you have villagers or something inside the engine, that's really the one of the best and only ways to take care of that. Is there a question potentially? Oh, let's see. Oh, and Emily says she's got to get going, so. Okay. Okay, a couple important reminders. Um, if you're going with a lake service provider, the DNR has a great program where they certify these folks and make sure that really gives you a little more assurance that the people who you're hiring are following AIS prevention practices. They're up on the science in terms of the best, the best approaches to manage them. And they're not going to be spreading stuff from other lakes to your lake. So really encourage you to look at that list first. Um, I think it's like a organized by county. So you can find somebody who's in your area. Some activities require a permit. Um, so it's always a good idea that you could either, Dan could probably tell you, or you would talk to, not Nicole, Chris. Chris. Chris, Chris Derek, yeah. Just give them a call and they can, they can tell you if you need a permit or not. And then if you're, say you are pulled up a bunch of vegetation that's got zebra mussels on it, you want what to do with it, they make great compost. If you don't want to deal with it yourself, you can take it to a yard waste, like a compost site. As long as it's got to be 300 feet, is it feet or meters? A solid distance from water. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do have to drive it somewhere and you're worried about like getting stopped by a conservation officer, there's a free self-issued permit. You're basically just attesting that you understand you're transporting invasive species, but you're only taking it from your property to the proper disposal site. It's also on the DNR website. So at that point, it's important then to focus to make sure that your lake doesn't become the source for the next population. A new infestation of zebra mussels. So updating signage is important. Um, if you have marinas or resorts on your lake, really looping them in to the new development um, with AIS and make sure that they have the materials and the knowledge to communicate that to their guests. A lot of lakeshore homeowners are not aware of the, um, the dock and lift transfer law. So getting the word about, about that is important. And then making sure folks know where and when the decon station is open. It's another nice resource. I like to, I wanna mention this real quick because I'm guessing, you know, you, you guys are here, so you're probably pretty oh, proactive talking to your neighbors and community. I guarantee you, you will run into somebody at some point who's gonna like say, what's the point? Because birds are spreading it anyways. So I just like to share that this has actually been researched. Um, there was a study done where scientists force fed ducks in captivity, a concentrated solution of small zebra mussels and they analyze the poop. Nothing survived. Um, and what's going on there, it's between the body heat inside a duck, the crushing mechanism of the gizzard and stomach acid, zebra mussels do not survive. And then another study looked at whether zebra mussel villagers could survive on duck feet or feathers when they move to different water bodies. And they had a small flock of mallards in a zebra mussel infested lake. They sort of shushed them onto land, put them in a clean, um, a, a clean kiddie pool, looked for villagers, a very, very tiny amount, like one, one mussel per duck or one villager per duck could survive. Like that was sort of the statistics. And then they, then they had a, a kiddie pool with really high concentration of villagers and they scared the ducks into the clean pool. And so, 
because a very small amount survived. So it's like statistically possible in this controlled environment where ducks are walking four feet between pools. <laughs> so it's like theoretically possible, but very, very um, unlikely. Those are the papers if anybody ever needs to actually provide those. So share that. And then this is just an anecdote. Um, I heard about this from one of the DNR um, boat inspection supervisors. And I think it's super interesting. Um, you know, you got Gold Lake where zebra mussels have been there for 12 years now, highly developed, popular destination lake. And over here we've got Agate Lake. Um, and I believe like her grandparents lived there. So she's very familiar with Agate Lake, spent a lot of time. Um, the distance between the two lakes is 600 yards. You have a lot, you have turtles, you have loons, ducks, moving back and forth all the time. It is still zebra mussel free after 12 years of being right next to Gull Lake. So purely an anecdote, but I find it kind of interesting. So I'm gonna talk real quick. How much, I don't, I'm not keeping track of time. Well, you got plenty of time. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just gonna to add to that. I remember in Wisconsin, there were some researchers I don't know if it was at the University of Wisconsin or maybe Trout Lake Station, but they but they looked at all these remote lakes within the state that arguably had had to have had loons and waterfowl coming in, and all these remote lakes that didn't have a public access, and noticing how all of them were invasives, free of invasives. So it's yeah. Again, it's probably possible that a duck or a loon can carry something, but it's. Not probably a very, very low, possible, but not probably, yeah, very low. Yep. Another catchy phrase that I use is that it's, you can watch the spread over time for zebra mussels over the state, for example, and you can just see them kind of march across the state and they follow the highways, not the flyways. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, the popular destination lakes are the ones that got it first. Okay, so let's let's try to talk about some positive things here. What what are we doing at Maserk to address the problem? Um, so zebra mussels are, we do all these public surveys and we talk to managers uh, from agency local governments all the time and and the public. And zebra mussels are pretty much consistently the number one most most hated invasive and that's for a good reason. Like they are they have a, a serious impact. They're probably one of the world's worst invaders. So we have been working on, on a lot of projects from the start. Um, some of these older ones, um, you know, helped us understand the, you know, we helped, we proved that zebra mussels were surviving in residual water, actually tested that in laboratory situations. Um, you know, Tina just mentioned the, that they're spreading on the highways and not the flyways. We, we backed that up with genetic relationships too. She kind of did, looked at the genetic relationships between zebra mussel populations and lakes to, to show that there really was a spread of, of local spread from popular lakes to the neighboring lakes. Um, and we've used a lot of modeling approaches to to build user-friendly tools to help managers prioritize where to where to spend the effort on surveillance for new detections um, and watercraft inspections. So this is a new tool that we de debuted um, two years ago called the AIS Explorer. And um, this is open to, it's free and open to anybody. Um, and it we tried to make it pretty user-friendly but it's really designed for um, local managers and folks with lake associations to be able to access all this information that we have from the history of the invasions of zebra mussels and starry stonewort is the other one included on this. We have this, we have this timeline of where they've been spreading. And we also have all this data that's collected by watercraft inspectors. And the, the key question that went into this model um, is, is what you ask a boater, okay, where were you last? And you know where the boater is when the survey is being taken. And then you also, they're also asked where, where are you going to be splashing your boat next? Um, and using that information, kind of layering it over water connectivity information and looking at the, the history of these species over the last, um, last two decades, it helped us build this model to really under, to prioritize 
and predict which lakes are going to become infested next. So this is a look at Sherburne County. We're looking at just zebra mussels. Um, and of course, we've just got um, Orno and what, what is this one? Big and Mitchell. Big and Mitchell. Big and Mitchell. Okay. Yep. Um, there's zebra mussel infested lakes, and the, the other lakes are at risk. And then there's, we have a color code. So, you know, um, 0 0.5. What that translates to is the model gives it a 50% chance of being infested with zebra mussels in the next eight years. The next eight years is there's nothing magical about that. It's just when the predictive power of the model seems to really drop off. And so what you can do with this is click on um, an individual lake that's included in the model and just and it will display the boater network, both incoming and outgoing. And this is the boater network <clears throat> for Lake Orno. And this is the incoming network. So when where you see those exclamation points are all existing zebra mussel infested lakes. And what you had, what was going on is about 60% of the boats coming to Lake Orno were coming from zebra mussel infested lakes. So it is not surprising at all that Lake Orono became infested with zebra mussels. But we were able to take all this data. Um, we, you know, we got a tremendous amount of it, a lot of support from the DNR on this. You know, we put in over, I think it started off as 1.6 million voter inspection surveys. We had to toss about 300,000 of them, just data clean up, confusion, whatever. We still had. 1.3 million surveys, um, and then layering that, you know, sending that to our statisticians and the supercomputing institute at the university, we're able to build this model to help predict the future of AIS and helps folks like Dan kind of figure out, all right, looking at the county, which are the lakes that are at risk? And that, that's where you would want to send your volunteer AIS detectors or your staff, because there's limited time, and this is designed to help people prioritize their efforts. Um, and if anybody, this is a really quick sketch of it, but if anybody's interested in learning more how to use and understand um, this dashboard, I'd be happy to set up the time to do that. The other half of this resource right now is, um, it's our prioritization for watercraft inspections tab. And this is at the county level where um, you know Dan can figure out. We have right now the menu is four species. So you can select which are your most important species you want to pre prevent, and then sort of set your, your goals for how many risky boats you want to intercept. And this is really about focusing on, it's not really about, it's it's designed to help. The county manager figure out where to where's the most effective place to put a watercraft inspector and the question there is where will that person encounter the most risky boats which is somebody that is coming from an infested to an uninfested water body and you run the model and then get an output of ranking you know which 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 are the highest impact lakes to station a person so from here Having, having Big Lake covered by inspection is the most important thing because we're talking also about interacting with the outgoing boaters. So one, one important caveat is <clears throat> 16 does not mean that Dan would be able to stop 90% of risky boats in Sherman County with 16 people. That's 16 lakes covered. We are not able right now to account for multiple launches. So that's where that local knowledge really comes into play um, because this is a statewide model, thousands of lakes, and there's not really a great, I mean, there is a data set about the number of launches, but we just don't have that resolution to figure out where, which launches people are coming to yet. So that that's the next step, but what this is saying is that if 16 lakes had inspection coverage and you know at the right time, the right number for each lake, you could prevent 90% of potential infestations, stopping those four species. So 
And getting back to the so just yeah because we can't really see this. So what are the four species? Oh, sorry. Um, zebra mussel, starry stonewort, Eurasian water milfoil, and spiny water flea. Okay, and then the sixteen lakes are Sherburn County lakes in this yes. case, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the top six there or whatever with colors? Sure, the top six are <clears throat> big eagle, elk, orono. Why is elk showing up twice? Two elk lakes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the second elk lake. <laughs> Little elk and big elk. Okay. And Fremont Lake. Okay. Thank you. That's. It is. Yeah. And, and I do use this resource when when uh, staffing inspectors and uh, it, it is helpful. It's, you know, anecdotally, you know, I, I, I kind of have an idea of where a lot of the traffic is, but this gives me a little bit more information in terms of how susceptible are these lakes given where people are coming from yeah. to these lakes. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, anyway, this would be an interesting conversation to have in the Sherman County Coalition of Lakes Forum in talking about how, how, did, how might this or should it influence our individual plans working together? Oh, yeah, I see what you want. Right. Did you have something, Shelley? Yeah, how much uh, more data is being put into the system yearly? Um, a lot. <laughs> we are going to be coming out with like a whole sort of new, a lot of updates on AIS Explorer in early 2023, we hope. And so all of this was built on inspection data from 2014 to 2017. The next round is going to include, I think it's going to be 2017 to 2020. And then we have another, a whole other tab, like a, a whole other model built that is going to allow managers to put in different interventions, like a decon or an inspection or an education effort at different lakes on the models and then see like what the prevention impact is. So that's. That's absolutely incredible. <laughs> it's going to be cool. I mean, we'll see. I, I haven't really played around with it very much, but um, yeah, it'll be exciting. So there'll be a whole bunch more workshops and stuff. Yeah. So on that, um, you mentioned the kind of theoretic 90% that would be the ideal protection. Is that broken down in a yes. in individual action steps that each of those characters could be? Taking? Um, well, okay, so this, so percentage of risky boats inspected. So the way this breaks down is so like Big Lake, if you just had an inspector at Big Lake, you would intercept 20% of risky boats. But it would be an inspector, how frequent versus what's currently occurring, right? Yeah, the question of like <clears throat> inspection coverage, like what does that, is a really tricky one and it you know it varies by states. like and that and that is where sort of the local manager knowledge really comes in this is sort of like best case scenario right but then yeah. so I'm backing out that what we could do together is look at best case scenario versus actual case scenario and then that give us our delta of I think, yeah I think that we'll have some options to play with that with this new mm. new set of tools that's coming out in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these are just some headlines. Uh, predicting a new invasive species is not, it's not fun to be correct about that, but I just shared these because these were all instances where the, this particular lake, Rainy and Leach, the ones um, in this batch of five, they were all like number one on the statewide list as most likely to be um, invaded with zebra mussels. So like, but like, yay, the explorer called it, but like, you know, no cause for celebration. I just share this to show that like, um, it, it, it does, it is pretty strong as a tool. Okay, so that's helping us, you know, that's helping us slow the spread. 
Um, and now we're working on this is a project to manage existing populations because we have hundreds of lakes that have zebra mussels and we need to give managers tools to manage the impacts. So um, soluble copper, I'll just call it copper sulfate at this point, um, is a long used aquatic pesticide. Um, so a lot of different things, which is one of the one of the one of the challenges of using it for zebra mussels, but it is effective on zebra mussels. But what we've been working on started in 2015 um, is figuring out ways to optimize copper, copper sulfate to kill or suppress as many zebra mussels as pop as possible while minimizing the impacts to non-target species. You know, you never want to do more harm than good. So it started with laboratory trials where we we're figuring out the best um, temperature and exposure time to kill young mus mussels. And since then, it's been gradually scaled up um, into, um, you know, the largest application was a 160 acre trial um, in a bay of Lake Minnetonka. Um, and then the, in 2021, and so we've been returning to that site every summer to monitor potential regrowth of mussels and check for um, the native species um, that may have been impacted by the treatment. So looking at native and invasive rebounds after the treatment. Um, and then there's been lakeside lab applications. There was, uh, this was done last summer at Pelican Lake in Crow Wing County, where we're now doing it in a much more controlled environment, like pumping in lake water to various tanks that have the mussels, and then a bunch of native test organisms to monitor their response to the copper and exposing them to different concentrations. So we're really starting to incorporate the chemistry of lake water at individual sites to try to really dial in the copper application. And this summer was shoreline treatments in Lake Minnetonka. Um, and I'm blast through this, but like this is this is from the treatment bay. Um, it was Robinson's Bay in Lake Minnetonka, and the, um, <clears throat> let's see, I think I'm going to go quickly to that. Basically, what we saw is that um, copper treatment did significantly reduce bellager density in the water column, um, both two weeks after treatment and then a year after treatment. Um, the the non-treated bay is the big black bar, so you saw that level much higher. The treated bay um, is these, these very narrow little lines in the red. Um, and this was for juvenile zebra mussel settlement, um, almost complete, com almost complete suppression in the year of treatment. We also saw very low levels in 2020. <clears throat> Mussels started to rebound in 2021. And then at this point in 2022, they are approaching the levels they were. So it, it appears that we got about three years of suppression um, in, in that treatment. Uh, another a positive thing though, too, is that after in some of the, a lot of the native species showed no impact to the copper treatment, but those species that were, that did get knocked back from the copper, had almost all of them had rebounded to pre-treatment levels by two years after treatment. So that's a positive thing. A lot of questions moving forward about, you know, the ecological benefits, what would happen, you know, is treating every three years, is that something that is desirable or realistic? Are there, eco what are the ecological benefits of suppressing zebra mussels for a short term? Those are sort of the questions that we're grappling with now um, with DNR and other agencies and researchers. So the current phase is continued monitoring in the 2019 and 2022 treatment sites, and then moving into sort of more of a decision support um, phase. Uh, we're going to be doing something called a structured decision making uh, workshop with agency folks. That's going to be a extensive process where we'll start to really grapple with the pros and cons and the logistics of applying this treatment and ideally figure out situations where this is an appropriate tool um, that managers could actually start implementing. So stay tuned on that. Um, and now this is an example of a project that's really getting us towards more of a eradication tool. Um, so 
there was a research team that mapped the zebra mussel genome. Um, so now we have chromosome level insights about what makes zebra mussels so successful. You know, we know exactly, we know what genes are responsible for shell formation or bissel thread attachment or th thermal tolerance. So that's exciting. And, you know, another cool thing was that all the data is open source. So there's a lot of people around the world working on invasive mussels and they now have this resource available to them. Um, and alongside with that, um, we have been working on a project to, inc to increase the capacity to propagate zebra mussels in the lab. Um, it's really surprising because they, zebra mussels do so well all in a lot of environments in the wild, but they are really difficult to raise in the lab. Um, you can go pull them out of the lake and keep them alive for a while, but they will not breed. Um, this has been a huge hindrance to zebra mussel research. So we are applying some of our funds and supporting Ben Minerick, who is, um, he is actually a native mussel um, propagation expert with the Minnesota Zoo. And so he's applying his expertise um, at our facility on the St. Paul campus to try to propagate zebra mussels in the lab. And we are, we're, we're making good progress. Um, it is encouraging. We're at the point where we're actually raising our own algae to feed the zebra mussels because they're, they're not happy with the shellfish diet that we fed them. So it is surprising, but once we can start, yeah. <laughs> once we can start propagating zebra mussels and getting them to breed in the lab and we have a year round supply of zebra mussels, that will help the other, um, the genetics work advance a lot faster. Um, and next door in the lab, we have an RNA interference project. So this could be like a whole to our presentation to try to explain what this is. So bear with me, I'm gonna do my best. So this takes the zebra mussel genome insights that we have, um, and they are designing um, our RNA, double-stranded RNA expressions in lake bacteria or algae that would be um, ingested by zebra mussel. And that RNA, that double-stranded RNA, once it's consumed by the zebra mussel, would then block expression of a certain target gene in a zebra mussel and hopefully sicken it or kill that individual directly. <clears throat> the difference between this um, and other genetic methods, like if you've heard of CRISPR or Cas9 or gene drive, this does not actually change the zebra mussel genome, which, which is a good thing. It's considered a lot safer um, line of technology here because it's not going to be, it's not passing a heritable trait. Like zebra mussels are bad enough and thought of like a genetically modified zebra mussel is kind of scary. And we just sort of think that the public acceptance of that and the regulatory pathway would be very steep and complicated. Um, it's going to be challenging enough with RNAi, but this is considered a lot safer. Um, the idea is you would have all this bacteria, normal lake bacteria or, or algae expressing this RNA interference strand. And it would only impact zebra mussels because it's only impacting a certain gene that zebra mussels have. So not just species specific, but gene specific to zebra mussels. So more to come on that. One of their big challenges is lack of zebra mussel supply year round. So Ken <coughs> moves forward with his propagation. This, this science is gonna really take off even more than our ideas. Um, yeah, and one of, the, one of the main last things with zebra mussels is that the whole, I wanna come back to the multiple AIS thing. This is sort of a emerging area of invasive species research is how multiple introduced species can interact. A lot of times, you know, they'll change something like with zebra mussels, substrate, water temperature and clarity, and they sort of create conditions that are more conducive to other invasive species. Um, you know, our native species, a lot of our, you know, aquatic plants or things like walleye, they don't like clear or warmer water, but an invasive species um, like curly leaf pondweed, Eurasian water milfoil, they love that. And just because they are more aggressive, they grow faster, 
um, reproduce more quickly, they're going to be able to capitalize on those conditions faster than native species. So that's just one of those like, synergistic interactions, but it's a big risk and it's a big unknown. So that's really why ongoing prevention is, is super important. Um, Dan, I can end there. I have a couple slides about starry stonewort and spiny water flea. I don't know if that's of interest. I guess I would ask the group. Are you interested in hearing about starry stonewort? Water, please, well. I forgot to start my timer, so I really yeah yeah we're 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 we've run long, but it's been really interesting, fascinating information. So I, I think it's absolutely worthwhile. I'm still listening, and we don't have it in our lake yet. So uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're willing to keep going, pass through real fast. Sure. Um. Okay, I think I people in Sherwin County seem to be pretty on it with starry stonewort, but so this is a invasive macroalgae. One of the things that's important is um. We have really limited control methods. Uh, it's better than zebra mussels. What's that? Who mussels? Let's just check that. Chat. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Let's just keep going. Great. Okay. Um, spreads usually the bone pathway. One of the reasons why it's hard to control is like it is not a vascular plant like Eurasian water milk, soil, curry leaf pond weed, where if you get an effective herbicide application, the plant uptakes the chemical, translocate it through the plant down to the roots, ideally. That's not an option with curly leaf because each one of these little branches and nodes is sort of like its own cell. Um, and you have to kill each of those because it can regenerate from a fragment. And curly leaf, uh, starry stonework. Star star <laughs> grows in these like dense pillows. So if you have an algicide, I mean, you really have to bathe it in that. And it's very difficult to get it down to touch all those spots and reside long enough in the water column to be effective. So algicides can kind of, that we say giving it a haircut, it can knock it back a little bit, but even worse is that um, we do not have any chemical approach that kills out these starchy bulbils. That's how it gets the name, starry stonewort. They are, I don't know, a couple couple millimeters across, very small, um, but very distinct. And so they also, like I said, they can um, spread through fragment, um, but the bulbils are another reproductive structure. And starry stonewort will produce gobs of bulbils over the summer. And then the green part typically dies back and it leaves the next year's cohort in bulbil form down in the sediment. And what's tricky is we really don't have any tool to control the bulbils right now. It's being worked on, but um, there, there's not a method. So what, what does work? Um, what does work is early detection and rapid response. That's why Starry Trek is super important. Um, we have had situations where an infestation is found early enough with aggressive repeated um, hand pulling we have really suppressed those populations. I don't think we're calling anything eradicated yet, but it does seem like it's possible. Um, a place like Lake Coronis, where it is, how many hundreds of, there, there are multiple hundreds of acres? Yes. Yeah. Right now, there's nothing that can be done with that other than manage the nuisance. So they've got harvesters out there just trying to maintain those navigational pathways let people have some enjoyment of the lake, but um, it's humongously expensive and it's not really knocking it back long-term. And now they have zebra mussels. So that's, that's gonna be really interesting to see what happens there. Spiny water fleas. Um, these are not just a Northern Minnesota problem, um, although that's where they are right now. I think a lot of our lakes in, down here, central Minnesota are potentially at risk as well. They are predatory zooplankton. No, no real predators in our lakes. Um, they're inedible to a lot of native fish and <clears throat> they also consume massive amounts of zooplankton. And we have no control methods either. Those are, those are the kind of thing that once they're in a water column, once they're in a lake, you kind of have to live with them at this point. <clears throat> um, and they are tiny, but they are, they're not microscopic uh, at all. And compared to native zooplankton, they're basically like the grizzly bears of the <laughs> zooplankton world. Um, 
this is this is sort of a relative scale. These are our our native um, zooplankton, really important parts of the aquatic food web, especially. Um, these are really important food for baby perch and walleye. Spiny water flea consume a lot of them. Um, they, they're highly predatory. And they're also, I mean, they are much larger than the native ones and by, more or less in, inedible to small fish. Um, and getting back to impacts of multiple AIS, especially zebra mussels and spiny water flea, I want to show a really, really simplified food web. But this is an un uninvaded lake. You know, the phytoplankton is like our, our, our grass plants that gets eaten by zooplankton. And the zooplanktivorous fish, like panfish and young walleye and perch, are food for adult walleye and fish that eat other fish. You add zebra mussels. Now you've removed a lot of the phytoplankton. So you have fewer zooplankton, and that impacts things, you know, to the zooplanktivorous fish and up the food chain. Spiny water flea are taking from the next level. They are eating a lot of zooplankton, so that reduces the food for the next levels of the fish that eat that. But when you have both, um, already you've got a depleted phytoplankton population from the zebra mussels, so that's going to lead to less zooplankton. Then you add spiny water flea that's taken a big hit on what's left of the zooplankton. That leaves very few resources left for the zooplanktivorous fish. And that's why, if you remember that slide I showed you about the large lake study, <clears throat> they saw that in lakes that had zebra mussels and spiny water flea, first year walleye were 25% smaller um, at the end of their first year. So, what can we do? Um, we already have uh, like a really amazing involvement and community in Sherburne County. I don't have to, I'm preaching to the choir, but these are some of the programs you already know about this. And Dan and Shelley, you kind of already covered this. So <laughs> thank you. Um, but if anybody's interested, talk to me, go to the website, talk to Dan. Um, we've got the AIS Detectors Program. We're back to uh, in-person workshops and there's an online component that you do ahead of time. Um, and then we have hands-on, a day-long workshop, um, which can be online if you're not comfortable with um, an in-person workshop, but the in-person is great. You, you, know, you learn directly from the experts. We've got um, lots of examples to learn from actual specimens and little models. Um, and you will learn kind of the, the, the biggest, the most high priority AIS and the native look likes as well as how to report them. Um, you know, DNR is the, the first line that you report a suspect sighting to, or you can talk to your county person, um, and they'll make sure that that sighting is verified and then the information is shared through appropriate channels. So we've got over 350 detectors since the program started in 2017, and this is a really important um, <clears throat> part of the AIS response in Minnesota because these DNR folks and the kind of people they have a huge area of responsibility and thousands of lakes um, and any more trained eyes that we can get always helps. Those are it was an outdated map of where we have people, but um, they're all over the state. Um, and then Starry Trek, you all know about that. I encourage you to keep up with that. Starry Trek volunteers have found about a quarter of the known. Um, Starry snore infestation, so it's a really important part of our response. And then we also have a, a spiny water flea surveillance program, which is very volunteer friendly. Um, if you're interested, grab one of my cards in the back and I can tell you all about it too. That's it. And at the back, I have a I have a one page, a two-page fact sheet with the zebra mussels. Now what information to still down? You can grab, grab a copy for yourself or your neighbors, and then there's um my business card and some annual reports. Thanks, Meg.